grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this day of the ascension is recorded for us in the first chapter of the book of Acts, the first 11 verses. I wrote my first book, that's the gospel according to St. Luke, I wrote my first book, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began doing and teaching until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and told them things about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the pro Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is God's word and God's promise. Dear friends in Christ, <clears throat> his name is Whiskey. A little, if you call a 65 pound golden retriever, little. It's our kid's dog. We're watching it for a couple weeks and he's, he's okay. He's a good dog. He's gentle, pretty obedient most of the time. Sometimes I think he is just really so intelligent. And other times, I think he's really so not intelligent. He loves to play. More than anything else in life other than eating, he loves to play. He loves to play tag. He loves to play fetch. He loves to play tug. And he likes to play hide and seek. Now here's where I come to think that sometimes he's not really all that sharp. That his IQ maybe is not all that high. Oh yeah, he knows how to play hide and seek. And he'll sit there calmly and obediently and wait for you to hide. And then you call him and he starts off eagerly in his tail's wagon. He's looking for you. But if he doesn't find you in a certain amount of time, he's done. You don't exist anymore. He either gets all frustrated and just starts ooh, 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 feeling sorry for himself. Woe is me. Or he just completely loses interest and goes off to chase his tail or chew on something he's not supposed to chew on or just take a nap. Something, I think, is wrong with him. He doesn't have this, this sense that you and I have come to get of, of object permanence. That just because something's out of your sight doesn't mean that it's gone. Doesn't mean that it's not exist. For goodness sakes, we learned that by the age of, what, six months, eight months, right? We all know that. We all do that. Or do we? How about our sense of object permanence with Jesus? When we're going through struggles, doubts, sufferings, pains, whatever it is in our life that's like, well, I don't see Jesus in this picture, and we, we go for a while, we don't think we're seeing Jesus, Jesus, our master, our savior, the God man who's still in charge of everything, who does everything, is the one who, from whom all good comes for now and forever, and we don't see him right now, and it's either just like whiskey, right? Oh, woe is me. And we go off and chase our tail or roll around in worldly filth or go and eat something that's going to give us worms, spiritually speaking, of course. That's what's so important about what Jesus church calls his ascension. When we have this lesson, this, this thing that makes it so clear, this, this object permanence of our Savior. See, we have this unexplicably great ability to be able to forget about God and his goodness and his power and his control and his blessings 
Even though we don't seem to have that same ability to forget the struggles and the difficulties and the troubles and the pains and cares, the things that are more short, short term, the things that are right in front of our eyes, we have this amazing capacity to be able to hold on to those. And not so much the things that are longer term, not as visible, but still just as real and much more important in a much greater priority for us in our lives. Okay, put yourselves in those disciples, those first century disciples' shoes, right? They're going to, Jesus told them, they're going to be up against it. The people that they knew and people that they loved and people including themselves were going to be marginalized, abused, even imprisoned and put to death. And for what? For believing in Jesus, for following this Christ Jesus. Friends were going to be torn apart. Families were going to be torn apart. And for what? For believing Jesus, following this Jesus. They needed something powerful as a reminder, didn't they? I mean, isn't it weird or at least interesting that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the single most important, most fundamental thing for our faith and for our forever, no one actually witnessed that. No one saw it. Yeah, there's plenty of proof. I mean, they don't, don't get me wrong on that. No one saw it, though. And then the ascension, that's just kind of, yeah, we, yeah we'll put it in. We'll move it up to the closest Sunday or whatever it is. And it's not really that big of a deal. He had everyone there for that. So that they could all hear his final instructions with their own ears. So they could all see him going away with their own eyes. He would be leaving he would be gone from their sight because his, his earthly career was over. And so he wanted everyone to know they're not supposed to just stand there at the door and either whine or forget about this Jesus. They weren't supposed to sit there and wait for this Jesus to do everything for them, to teach for them to instruct for them, to be nice to other people for them, to counsel and encourage for them. Yeah, he wanted there to be no doubts that he was going to put their, eye, their minds at ease that his visible presence was being removed from them. Oh, they didn't get it right away. They're just standing there. And I wonder, you wonder how long they would have stood there just staring with their mouths wide open if God hadn't so kindly sent his angels to, to kind of spur them on to, to snap them out of it? Sounds kind of like they're scolding. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? What are you staring at? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And isn't this kind of like us? Again, whenever we're scared or frustrated or disappointed or whenever we just maybe stop caring, this is just like us blankly staring off at the last place that we think that we saw evidence of our Savior. And again, if you're a golden retriever, okay, that's not a big deal. But we're not. We're God's people. And so we need to see and hear exactly what those first disciples heard. What are you staring at? What are you staring at? Jesus isn't going away because he doesn't like you anymore. He's not going away to get some R&R &R because, man, it's been a long 30-some years that he's put in doing all this stuff of obeying God perfectly in your place because you couldn't and then going off and suffering and dying as that one flawless sacrifice that could pay for everyone's sins. Yeah, everything that God required of Jesus to do to pay for us, he did it. Every single bit of it, that was covered perfectly. Not one thing left for him to do in that regard. He completely kept all God's rules for us. His death certainly did pay every red, last red cent of what was required for our sin. That was done once and for all. So that Hebrews 10 says, this priest, after he offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down at the right hand. So we know for sure, as Romans 8 tells us, there's now no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. 
God had sent his son on a rescue mission, and it was mission accomplished. The whole point of Jesus coming here to earth, it was done. It was a done deal. But just because that biggest, most important job of all was absolutely completed didn't mean that Jesus didn't still have a few more items left on his clipboard for him to do for his people. As he left, taking back the full use of his divine glory and honor. Part of that was so that he said he wouldn't be leaving them as orphans. Yeah, he was still going to be there. His presence, though not visible, was going to always, always be with his people. But he was also something that he had to leave for and take back all his glory to do as one who is equal in every way with the Father and the Holy Spirit to be able to, in his state of glory, send out the Holy Spirit. Send them to these apostles, these, these ones who were chosen to do that apostolic work. Gave the Holy Spirit to them in a special way so that they could even write down the inspired word of God that would be the carrier, the conduit for the Holy Spirit to come to a whole lot of other people too. The way that God has told us that his Holy Spirit has chosen to come into our hearts and lives and give us faith and keep that faith and strengthen that faith and to make his disciples and all his followers his witnesses. People would have that faith and that security and want other people to have that faith and that security and have that confidence of knowing that, yeah, Christ is really reigning in all his glory, ruling and controlling all things for the good of his people, his church. Still at work, he says here, preparing our place for us. That means it's only a matter of time before he comes back to take us to be with him. And the way the angels say it, in the same way you have seen him go. Not secretly. Not gradually, but all at once, visibly, so everyone would know and with nothing else to prepare for in between. As Hebrews chapter 9 very clearly tells us that this Jesus, God's Son, came into our human history once the first time to work out salvation for us, and he's coming back the second time to take us into the full realization of that eternal life to where we get to ascend to be with him, so that our bodies and souls together perfectly, like his perfect body and soul together, ascend to be with him in glory and happiness and perfection for all of eternity. So what are you staring back at? Jesus left because he had something to do for you. And so do we have something to do. See, this, this, this Jesus who ascended in such a dramatic way, Disciples recognize, okay, they're not going to be able to, to count on him to just pop in on them every time now. That they shouldn't be sitting back and, and, and listening for him to talk to them in some kind of an audible way. They shouldn't be searching around behind the door to see if they could find him in a visible way. No, he says, you got work to do, and I want you to be doing it. I want you to be getting off the bench, getting into the game. Don't be standing on the sidelines. No looking at the sky, wishing that you could see his visible presence. No searching around, wishing you could hear some kind of a voice. You have all that you need right here to do the work that he wants you to be doing. Yeah, there's a plan. The plan that Jesus says is like this. It's like the master putting the servant in charge of every single thing he owns. The steward, which of course is a, a completely different way of looking at everything, isn't it? The fact that everything that we have in ours and have and are isn't really ours. It all belongs to God. This is all God's stuff and we're simply taking care of it for him. This is what we like to call stewardship, but we get so mixed up and we think stewardship is that, that okay, that 10% or 12% or 8 or 6 or 15 or whatever it is that we've chosen to, to give as an offering to our Lord. But it's not. He says it's about the 100%, including the other 90%, and the way you use that for your family or your recreation or your saving or your charities or your government or whatever it is that you're to use those things for. And your time, it's not just about that 
hour that you put in at church or at Bible class or, or at the workday. It's how you use all the other hours that are left in the day and week. And all our vocations and all our belongings and all our time and everything, it's all his. And isn't Jesus' ascension the perfect reminder to us of that? That we don't expect to see him doing the things for us. He expects to see us doing the things for him. So he's not going to be looking over our shoulder and say, hey, why don't you put a, another zero on that, that check you're writing for the church offering? Hey, why don't you sign up to do this for the church? Oh, hey, there's someone over there who looks like he or she could use your encouraging or your help in some way. Oh, hey, that looks like someone that you should be telling me about. We don't hear that. We don't have him setting our alarm clock so that we get up at the right time in the morning and pushing us out of bed and say, yeah, it's time for church. We don't have him saying, no, no, come on, really? You're going to let that little sinful, prideful thing, that little picky thing, you're going to let that get in between you and the use of God's word? You're going to get that little thing that you have a little issue with? You're going to get let that get in between you and God's family that he loves just as much as he loves you and wants you to be serving and loving and helping? We don't see Jesus telling us these things. He, he's kind of... I guess, left us on the honor system. Isn't that what his ascension means to us? He's left us, but not without the facts and not without the power. He's left us with his holy word. Not that says, oh, come on, you could do better than that, or, or maybe if you try again, you could do it right this time. No, his word that says, I have paid for all your sins. You're part of my heavenly family. God says you're okay. As much as he says, I'm okay. The devil can't control you anymore. Death can't even hold you. I have a place for you in my heaven. Doesn't that make you want to get off the, the bench and into the game? And as he promises, surely I am with you always until the end of the age. He's still there. He's still here, giving us everything we need to be his disciples. Yeah, that sounds like such a tough job sometimes. Like, I'd rather just take it easy and, and, and forget about it. Or let someone else do it. That they probably do it better than I would anyway. Or, or, you know, it seems like I'm just banging my head against the wall doing things for these people. I, I don't want to be this follower, this disciple anymore. And our God comes and what does he say? What are you staring at? What are you staring at? My son scooped you up when you were plummeting into eternal damnation. He rescued you from hell. He forgave all your sins. He made you, he made you so I can call you my own. He gave you power. He gave you all these things to be able to do these things. You're Jesus. He rules the universe and makes absolutely everything. Even the bad things serve your best. How can you not want to do this? This Jesus who says, yeah, he ascended, but, but we think ascending to heaven, and I'm thinking the little kid lost his balloon, and you watch it until you can't see it anymore. These, these rockets, and you're watching and watching until the last little. No, no, no. This is why, wh how he describes it. He says he starts to go up, and as they're seeing him blessing them, what happens? A cloud removes him from their sight. He's not way, 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 way up there. Where is he? Way, way, way right here. And not in a way we can see, but that way, is coming soon, because when he leaves, he says, I'm coming back. At the beginning of World War II, right? We had General MacArthur on the island of the Philippines, and, and what a, a tragic situation as he's forced to have to leave, and especially for those, those Philippine friends of ours. It's like, wow, here's, here's, the, here's our strength, right? Here's, here's what we had. Here's what we could trust and count on and rely on, and now it's, it's going away. It's leaving, but it says not for good. Right, MacArthur said, I shall return. And, and those, those Philippine people, they believed it. And they stood their ground and they stayed determined. And that was their rallying cry. And that was their call. And, and that's where they were able to gut out the next couple, two and a half years. With determination and courage. And, and how exciting and joyful it must have been when they saw that fulfillment, right? When the troops landed back at Leyte Gulf. And there's, there's all the forces. And, and, and everything's going to be okay again. And isn't that what we have? 
Well, not really, because that can't even come close to what we have on either end. Because when Jesus was left, it wasn't because the enemies were chasing him out of town. It was because he had already thoroughly conquered and demolished anything that resembled a threat to us. He crushed all our enemies. The last thing we see, right? The hands of blessing, those nail prints of, of proof of him saving us, and those hands of blessing, the last thing on our minds, to see that's what he's constantly doing, constantly blessing us. And that when he says, I'm coming back, I shall return, he is always good on his word. And what a difference that makes in our lives, even in our struggles and difficulties, in our jobs, as his witnesses. What would be the coolest job in the world? It probably doesn't exist. But wouldn't it be if there was some bazillionaire that just like giving money to people? Checks of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you got to be the one that he used to give that to people or after giving you one. God has done us one better, one, one infinitely better than that. We get to be the ones to hand out this thing from God after he gave it to us first. His gift of eternal life. What's more exciting than that? What an honor. And to be able to see the future as Jesus has given it to, to know how this all turns out that we've already won, all for sure. So what are you waiting for? Jesus has made us his witnesses. We have the facts. We have the power. We have the Holy Spirit. We have his promises. What are you staring at? There's work to be done. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to confess that Christian faith he's given us. We'll do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand? <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.